in 1 Corinthians. I'll just grab my Bible. One Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to read verses 12 to 31, and I think it'd be good if we stand. Uh, we won't read it together, I'll just read it, but uh, stand up, have a bit of a stretch before we uh, um, listen to the next hour of Matt. He's promised me you won't speak for an hour. First Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll start at verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts... But all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Have a seat and... Um, An elderly woman walked into a church and the friendly usher uh, greeted her at the door and helped her up the flight of stairs and said, where would you like to sit? And he asked asked that politely. In the front row, please, she answered. Very unusual, I could see. Um, And he went, look, I really don't think you should do that. Maybe you guys have heard about me beforehand. He goes, really? I really don't think you should do that. The usher said, the pastor is really boring. Do you happen to know who I am? The woman inquired. No, he said. I'm the pastor's mother. She replied indignantly. Do you know who I am? He asked. No, she said. Good, he answered. (laughs) Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just uh, ask that you would give me the words to speak and each of us, Lord, myself included, the ears to hear. I just ask that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts and minds. I ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. So an explanation up front regarding what we're going to be looking at today. So given that the topic that we're looking at um, is a fairly big one, rather than draw from only one main passage, which is what I'm accustomed to do, uh, I'll be drawing from a number of different passages, So, uh, which look specifically at the purpose of the church, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Is that just rubbing against my thing there, is it? I'll move it. Give me a tick, otherwise it'll drive you crazy. So, I think I've got it. Oh, it's there, is it? Right. I'll try not to move so much. So before we get into this sermon, let me ask you a question. 
something I'd like for you to mull over. So you don't need to answer it, um, just something for you to think on. Why are you here today? What is it that has brought you to gather here to this eye-catching, big, beautiful building here in Forbes? It's an interesting question, especially given that for a long while we obviously were not able to meet together in this way. Why have you exited from your comfy, COVID-free lounge to sit in these not-so-comfortable church chairs? Really, why are you here? What brings you to this place? Don't get me wrong. I believe that you are exactly where you should be. You are exactly where you should love to be. What better place could there be than to be in the house of the Lord, side by side with your spiritual brothers and sisters? What more exciting place could there be for you to be at? Uh, what is potentially the cutting edge of your week spiritually. Hebrews 10, uh, 24 to 25 tells us, and let us consider how to stir up one another to, to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's it. This is a place where you can hear teaching that could and should affect your eternity, a place where you are challenged in your walk, sometimes even warned or disciplined in your walk with Jesus, a place where you are encouraged, where you can encourage others um, to grow in Christ and the, in his body, the church, as iron sharpens iron, uh, a place where your spiritual gifts can be utilised, um, as was the plan for you, even before you were born, for the glory of God and for the building and encouragement of his church, both locally as well as universally. And that's an encouraging thought, isn't it? God planned for you to be here in this church with your gifts, specifically for a purpose or the purpose of building and supporting his church. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. A place where you can take rest in the comforting arms of our loving Lord. A place where you can discover life and purpose through the power of the Holy Spirit. A place where you can bring corporate praise and worship to the one true God, the Creator God, your God. Seriously, what better place could there possibly be than other, other than maybe heaven itself than for you to be here today in the very presence of God? Where two or more are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. You are now, right now, sitting as one of the saints, surrounded by saints, um, with a 1.5 metre distancing requirement there, in the very presence of the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, creator God. What possibly could the world have to offer that is even remotely close to this? I don't care how nice your reclining sofa is at home. I don't care how nice your homemade latte or cappuccino machine is and how, how that nice that might be, or how comfy it might be to do church in your PJs. Nothing beats being physically with our Christian brothers and sisters in the Lord's house. Nothing beats it. And yet, do we recognise this? Do we look at the person beside us and see a saint or a sinner? Do we see the person uh, beside us or in front of us or behind us as God sees them? Do we feel God's mighty presence around us or have we allowed our spiritual eyes to be blinded? our spiritual ears uh, to be deafened, our spiritual mouths to be silenced. When you sing or do you hear the voice of angels rising with your own? Are you deafened by their praise and worship mingled with that of your own and the saints that are around you? Are, or are you stuck on this plane, hearing only the off-key note of a singer, which you weren't, it was fantastic, I have to say. <laughs> 
not, if you hadn't been a bad singer, it would have made that a lot better, but you're brilliant. But that off-key note of a singer, the wrong note of a musician, which again didn't happen, or the offensive beating of a drum. What is church? Why do we come together as we do? Why has God called you here? What is the nature and the purpose of church? These are what we're going to be touching on today. You know, sometimes I think we can actually forget why it is that we're here in the Lord's house, that we can be so tied to tradition and routine that we don't see, see the trees because of the forest. We become so stuck in our ways that if God actually tried to move amongst us from our, or move us from our comfortable pew or seat, we would become indignant, offended, angry. We see change if it doesn't fit into what makes church comfortable for me is unnecessary, unwanted, even evil and from the devil. Or it can be the other way. Maybe we look enviously at how other churches do church and want our church to fit that same glove. We want good-looking preachers. Well, you're in luck. I'm going to say you got James. <laughs> good-looking preachers who dress in the best stylish suits, wear Doc Martin's shoes. I don't know if he does that. No, he doesn't. Doc Martin's shoes and preach like Satan himself is banging on the doors of the church. Or we want all our music to be um, up to date, the latest hits, modern music with a modern professional band at the expense of the music of the past, the wonderful music of the past. Is that what church is about? Is church meant to be stagnant, never moving, never changing, always the same? Is church meant to be a revolving doors of ideas and expectations, ever moving forward, ever changing, never the same? I think the answer for all of that is a resounding no. So what then is the church? What is the nature and the purpose of the church? Well, let's first look at what the church, according to the Bible, actually is defined to be. So the English word church gets its origins from the Greek word ecclesia, which is, in a literal sense, it means called out. A, a term used to identify um, an assembly of specific people. The second meaning that can be derived from this word church is found extensively throughout the Old Testament based on the Hebrew word kohal, which simply means assembly. This could be an assembly of preachers or soldiers or the people of God. So you can see why the word church, when you look at that, fits both of those meanings, can't you? As a believer... Oh, sorry, as we believe that as Christians, we are a group or assembly of people, members of or part of the body of Christ, which is made up of individuals that have been called out from the world, reconciled to God through our confessed belief in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, this in itself has two different levels, you might say. The first dealing with the local church, for instance, the saints, that's you and I, um, who gather together in the name of the Lord here at Forbes Baptist Church. This is based on a geographical setting, you might say. This can be made plural, though, also like what we see in Galatians 1-2 when Paul addresses his letter to the churches in Galatia, both dealing with a different level of local church. While the second level deals with the universal church of which both uh, we both, as individuals and as a congregation, are a part of. So the church, it's not a building. It's the people who come together in the name of Jesus, either locally or universally. So with this in mind, let's now look at the purposes of the church. I better catch up with my slides. The first purpose of the church, uh, that is the first reason that you and I are here, gathered together in the name of Jesus, is because we have been called to bring worship in its different forms to our God. Um, we, you and I, have been created ultimately for this purpose, to worship our God. Worship is the human response, our response to an all-powerful, almighty God who created and sustains all things uh, through his divine will and power. 
Worship can be something that is deeply personal between only yourself and God, or it can be openly corporate uh, as we bring worship to our Lord as a body of believers. Or it can be both simultaneously. Both styles of worship, they are extremely um, important. And in general terms, they cannot exist without the other, really. Therefore, in no way, shape or form is it an accident that worship of our God has a prominent place as we meet together as a church. Paul, as we've seen in Romans 12.1, says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, in the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. William Temple defined worship along these lines. For worship is the submission of all our nature to God, is the quickening of conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of his will to his purpose, and all of this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable, and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness which is our original sin and the source of all actual sin. Now, when considering worship, I think we can place the nature of worship onto two different sides of a coin. One being our inter internal response and the other being our external response or public expression to worship. Both are required to give that coin value. Without both sides, the coin becomes worthless. Worship can take a number of external different forms, just, just to name a few. So um, if it could be through the public, public reading of the Bible, um, praise for him through um, corporate prayer or the exaltation of his name. Uh, it could be an uplifted voice, congregational singing, um, or even just music, or as we've seen today, that solo where we can praise um, God um, through listening and as our hearts are lifted with that. Um, we see in 2 Chronicles 5.13 uh, that music is one of those things. It could even be in dancing, um, heaven forbid that, Psalm 149.3, um, but it could be. Uh, it could be through our cheerfully gener generosity towards others in the name of the Lord, as we see in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 2. The use of our spiritual gifts for the glory of God and the building of his church. And finally, and most importantly, internally, um, as we see in Romans 12, that Romans 12, 1 passage, uh, presenting your bodies as, living, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. That is to hand your entire life over to be under the lordship of Christ Jesus. The French have a proverb which states, a good meal ought to begin with hunger. Sometimes the best meals can be wasted if you aren't hungry. Rather than eat because you're in need of food, we eat just out of habit um, because we always have dinner at six, even if you're not yet hungry. But when you are hungry... Nearly everything tastes good. We enjoy it. Our body um, takes it in. It's not wasted. Instead, it is satisfied. Effective worship begins with a hunger for God. Do you have that hunger for him? Do you have that hunger for him? Because where you do, then you will find that your worship of him will become natural fulfilling and deeply satisfying. The second purpose of the church is to minister to and to build up the Christians who form the church itself. Uh, the members of the church are to be built up and strengthened, uh, nurtured from babies in the faith through to maturity. This happens in a number of ways through the preaching and teaching of God's word. Uh, it's a fairly obvious, obvious one, isn't it? But it's not as obvious as you might think. Retired preaching professor wrote about a true story of a man who experienced a rude awakening in the church. Often this guy would fall asleep in church uh, and on this particular day it was no different and he f again fell asleep as he always did. Only this time while he was asleep the power, um, it was a power outage and it left the church in absolute total darkness. 
Now, the pastor didn't even use notes. He's unlike me who needs them. Um, So he continued to preach anyway. He just kept on preaching. Somewhere towards the sermon end, the groggy parishioner woke up and he rubbed his eyes. He couldn't see a thing. He heard the preacher. He could feel his wife and daughter on both sides of him, but everything was pitch black. In a state of panic, he stood up and declared, Help me, I'm blind! Laughter filled the darkened room. One complacent church member experienced revival at the altar of embarrassment. And one blessed pastor enjoyed some poetic justice. Colossians 1.28, which says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That's a big part of our role. We're called to preach and teach faithfully from the pulpit. And both uh, we, both you and I, are also called to grow from this teaching, not to sit in a comatose state, to take heed of what it is that's being taught, to put it into practice, to, to have your Bible open, to check it, to go back after the service and look through that, to ask questions if you're not sure about something. Now, I enjoy listening to some preaching online uh, via podcast, or TV or radio. One of my favourite guys that I got to listen to uh, was Ravi Zacharias, who's just recently passed away. Um, and I know some, some of you guys also do, and that's fine. Um, in fact, it's been necessary recently during the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, it's what we're still doing over in parks um, as I record my messages and I put them up online. Uh, not the way that we want it to be, obviously, as we've said, but a necessity still for us at the moment uh, so that we can stay connected as a church during these unprecedented times. Um, but ultimately, it cannot take the place. In fact, it just doesn't stack up with your church being with your church family to hear God's word. One of a better word to hear it live, in person, sitting beside other saints. To gather together where, with others just helps with both our own growth as well as it encourages it in others also. In fact, one of the things that we're also called to do as a church is to encourage one another. Um, a couple of verses, for instance, uh, that we've already looked at to confirm this, like the um, iron sharpening iron verse or the Hebrews 10 passage. Um, if you're watching uh, another preacher or on the internet or TV or radio, no matter how good that preacher, he, no matter how good he might be, if he is not your pastor, then he's not your local expression of church. He can preach, but he's not here to pull you up um, and to warn you when you sin. He can teach, but he's not here to bury or to comfort you or your loved ones when disaster strikes. Online preachers, they may be good, but they don't have the same accountability as your local guy. Did you know, did you know that James has a biblical responsibility concerning you? Did you know that? James has a biblical responsibility concerning you where he is held to account by God. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. James has to give an account to God over how he has watched over your souls. That's why we as ministers take our preaching, for instance, so seriously. That's why we stick to biblically based preaching. So you can have the best opportunity to grow and we, James here in Forbes and myself in Parks, can have the best footing when we have to stand in front of our God and give an account of how we dealt with the members of his church, how we preached his word, how we have shepherded his people. Another way uh, we fulfill this purpose of the church is so that you can exercise your spiritual gifts to serve one another for the glory of God and for the building up of his church. Romans 12, 6 to 8. 
um, says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion uh, to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Every Christian has a spiritual gift given to them by God. It is to be both used for the glory of God as well as for the building up and benefit of the local church through the prompting and power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is true for every single believer. All of us, without exception, have been given some form of gift. Um, can be multiple, which when used as intended, no matter what it is, is an absolutely amazing thing. You are blessed, the church is blessed, and God is honoured. In our main passage for this sermon, it in itself is self-evident that there are many parts uh, to the body, all with their own part to play, uh, based on the gifts that they have been given by the one God empowered by the same Spirit, which we've all drunk from. But it, if it is not used in this way, or in any way, because some people don't use their gifts at all, then firstly you forfeit the blessing of God in this area. And you let the team down as church is missing something that only you can provide. I believe that by not using your gifts for the glory of God and the benefit of the church community that you have been called to be a part of, if you refuse to use it, then you are showing disdain for the gift that you have been given. And you, and this is a big one, you will also be dishonouring the gift giver. You and I will have to eventually give an account, a direct account, to an all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing God as to how you use the gift that he gave specifically to you. Think of the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 to 30. This then leads us into the last area for this section, being uh, through our acts of service. Now, this can be um, for fellow believers. So those parts of the church as we see in uh, passages such as 1 John 3, 16 to 18, where the Bible tells us, uh, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's, good, uh, the world's goods and sees his brothers in need yet cl closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. If we see our brother in need, we're called to support in a practical way. Maybe to supply a meal, maybe to cut and deliver some wood, financial support, yard work, whatever, whatever that might be. But we're actually called to go even further than just serving our own brothers and sisters. Uh, Jesus tells us in uh, Luke 6, 35 and 36, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Our love and kindness should be evident to all both the saint and the sinner, not only in word, but in deed. The third purpose of the church is for the church, you and I, to reach out into the world with the good news about Jesus. Uh, we see this command in Matthew 28, when our risen Lord commanded, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We're called to share the good news. There's nothing more powerful, nothing more potent than the gospel, is there? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, it has changed countless lives, impacted numerous families, empowered umpteen communities, and it has even set direction for entire nations. You see, the job of the church 
is not to impact the church, but to impact the world. It's like a a huddle in a football game. 100,000 people at the MCG don't pay money uh, for a ticket to watch the AFL or NRL teams uh, in a huddle, do they? Uh, What if you were to see, for instance, one of my favourite teams, Hawthorne versus Geelong? It'd be a ripper game. And for two and a half hours, if you were to turn up there expectantly and you, all you saw was 22 men stand in a circle and talk about what they're going to do. That's not what you paid for. 100,000 people pay a ticket to see what difference the huddle makes in action, does it, don't they? There'd be a riot if that's all that happened. And there should be a riot here. I'm not saying that you should riot. What they want to know is how, what, how, what, what it is that they've spoken about in the confines of the huddle. They want to see, does it work in the public arena, in the game itself? The challenge for the church is not only what we do when we call our Sunday morning huddles, but what we do when we break the huddle and we head out into the Sunday morning assignment. When Satan lines up against us, what difference does it make that we are Christians? What difference does it make that we are Christians? And that's the thing. Are we believing Jesus and being obedient to him and making a difference in this world? We are called to share this good news, this news that our sins are forgiven through the sacrifice, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ our Lord on the cross. And we share the hope that we hold to because uh, he was then raised from the dead on the third day. It's something worth sharing, isn't it? Something worth sharing with your family who don't know Christ, with your friends who don't know Christ, with your work colleagues, with your mother's group with your schoolmates, with your enemy. It's worth sharing it with him or her, with this nation, with the entire world. This is the third purpose of the church. Not the least important, all of these purposes are commanded by our Lord in the Bible. And we, the church, you and I, have been called to balance these purposes in our own lives as well as corporately. To focus on one and to neglect another is not an option. I'll finish with this quote. I've just tweaked it a little bit. This is my church. It is composed of people just like me. It will be friendly if I am. It will do a great work if I work. It will make generous gifts to many causes if I am generous. It will be a place of encouragement if I encourage. It will be a place of true worship if I worship truly. It will bring others into its fellowship if I bring them. Its seats will be filled with them. It will be a church of loyalty and love, of faith and service. If I who make it what it is am filled with these, therefore with God's help, because only through the power of God can we do this, I dedicate myself to the task of being all these. Is that you? Will you dedicate yourself also in these positive ways? for the glory of God and his church. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word. It's just such a powerful thing, Lord. It is such an amazing uh, privilege that we have to be able to read it. Lord, I just ask that for us uh, here, Lord, that for the, the people of the Forbes Baptist Church, Lord, that you would touch their hearts Lord, that they would be encouraged where encouragement is required, Lord, as they see that they are uh, walking in your way. And Lord, that they would be challenged in areas that they need to be challenged, that your Holy Spirit would touch them there as well, in the areas that they know that they need to change or that they need uh, to, to look at differently, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for this church and the light that it is in darkness. 
Lord, I thank you for the Falls Baptist Church and, and Lord, the people who are here and their love for you. And Lord, I just ask that you would use them and continue to use them, Lord, in a mighty way to reach out into this community, to reach out to their friends and family, to their work colleagues, to the mothers group, Lord, to each and every aspect of the society that they touch for you, to bring your, not the, the knowledge of you to others, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you would help them to be a, a praying church, a church that lifts up, Lord, those that are in need, lifts up um, with a heartfelt, just a, a passion, Lord, those that are lost. And Lord, I just ask that you would answer their prayer. Lord, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for the leadership of this church, Lord. And I just ask that you would bless them in all that they do. And I ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Thank you.